Um, I'm autistic. Well, specifically, I have autism spectrum disorder, sensory processing disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm, what else is there? Oh, generalized anxiety and just a little bit of dyslexia just to make things fun, right? Why have mild autism when you can have spicy autism? Am I right? Chili lime for you guys. So basically, my brain works a little different than everybody else's. I'm processing the world just a tiny bit different. And that's because I am neurodivergent. I am Jennifer Johnson, and I am neurodivergent. And that sounds really fancy, right? Like I should be in a, a young adult novel or some sort of a superhero group with psionic powers. But um, to be clear, I do not have any superhero powers that I know of. Good. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'm going to give you kind of a high-level overview of what neurodiversity is. Um, and that's because there's a whole bunch of really good TED Talks that have already been given by neurodivergent people on neurodiversity. So why reinvent the wheel? Basically, neurodivergent people or neurodiversity means that our brains, neurodivergent people's brains, process the world just a little bit different than the normal or typical brain, right? It's different. It's not wrong, just different. And that's because we have a wonderful grouping of people that make up our neurodiverse group, tribe, kin, whatever you want to call it. And that includes people with, this is a long list, but autism, ADD, ADHD, OCD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyslexia, and Tourette's, and a whole bunch of others. It, we're all over the place, basically. Uh, it's a big group. And the reason it's a big group is because approximately one in seven of us in the whole world is neurodivergent. 15%. It's about 15% of the whole entire world is neurodivergent. We are everywhere. We are your family. We're your friends. We're your coworkers, students. We are politicians, comedians. We're everywhere. But we're kind of struggling. And that's because we're trying to live in a world that isn't designed for us. And that can kind of be problematic. So. The neurodiversity movement, basically, strives to educate people and let people know that, yes, we process the world in a different way, but that's not a wrong way, right? It's just different. It's not broken. We don't want to be cured. We don't need to be fixed. We're not puzzles to be put back together. We want people to focus on our strengths and, you know, sometimes our differences, but mostly our strengths so that we can fit in with the mainstream of society. Now, the reason for that, um, Harvey Bloom, uh, who is a taxonomist, basically what he said was that neurodiversity and neurodivergent people may be every bit as important in so far as differences go as biodiversity is for the world in general, right? Who is to say that something is wrong just because it's different, right? And that's kind of problematic because that's not how our school system and our world is set up. If you are a fish and you are told your entire life that you're gonna be judged by your ability to climb a tree, you're going to kind of think you're dumb, and that's wrong, right? So that means that we need to help provide support for people that are neurodivergent. And remember, that's 15% of the population, so we should be getting on board this train and helping all the members of our community, because we are all members of this community. Duh. So what I want to talk to you today is about how we can use the technology and 
the advances that came about during the quarantine, during this time of social distancing, to help out our neurodivergent group so that the entire community can be served well in the American school system. And it is my belief that if we do this, if we change just a little bit how we're teaching, that we can give our neurodiverse brethren a lift up and help amplify their voice and give them what they need. And as a bonus, it helps out the normal people too. So, hey, what is there to lose? So let's take a look back to see where we're going. When we talk about the American school system, the neurodivergent group hasn't been served very well for very long. In fact, uh, up until the 1970s, it wasn't being served at all. And that was because two cases that uh, came about brought changes into how the neurodiverse kids were being served. Previous to this, schools could basically say, we don't want you in our school at all. So you couldn't go to school, even though it was considered compulsory. Or you could be put in an institution. Basically, that's it. Um, the cases that came about that went all the way to the Supreme Court said, yeah, no, you can't kick kids out just because they have a learning disability. You have to give them a chance. So now the kids are in the class. Then a couple years later, we had legislation that came about that said that if you're gonna get federal funding, you have to provide a school environment for the kids with learning disabilities so that they get the same experience as the normal or typical children, okay? And that led to where we are today because the legislation kept getting amended and we came into what is called the accommodation model. And that is where students that have a diagnosed learning disability can have special accommodations that are given to them that will help them have the same experience as a normal, typical student. And what that looks like is like if you're dyslexic, you might be given a different color of paper or with a different font instead of just white paper. You might be able to have your questions read to you on a test. If you are ADD or ADHD, it is possible that they could go ahead and let you have a take-home test so that you could take the test in an environment that you can be calm and pay attention in. And that's good. Um, it's a lot better than not being able to go to school at all, but it's not great because you still have the stigma of being different. You've got special accommodations and all the other kids know it. In addition to that, there is also the idea that you have to have a diagnosis. What if you can't get a diagnosis? It's great in the UK, they've got insurance. Not so much in the US. And then you've also got the case of people that might have a mild version of a learning disability. They might not test well and not get the accommodations that they need and consequently not do well in school at all. So the states began to build their legislation to try and help people out. And um, in Texas, it is 280 pages of different rules and regulations. I highly recommend it if you are an insomniac. And they, the cities and the school districts started coming together and they're trying to help people out. And then last March, the world turned upside down, as Hamilton would say. The quarantine, social distancing, there was an emergency bit of schooling where everybody was learning at home with no support at all. And then after a summer spent in limbo, we started to see the distance learning model coming back into vogue. Because now schools had to figure out a way that they could have both in-person and online schooling in order to keep social distancing in place because of legislation. Now, distance learning up to this point was kind of operating on a model of 
either synchronous, where everybody's all learning at the same time, asynchronous, where you have stuff like a discussion board or assignments and you just kind of look at it and interact that way. Some blended, where you might have a little bit online and then you have to turn stuff in. But there was no model that allowed for people to be at home and in class and learn at the same time. And that's where we came into what is called the AB model. Some people call it the differentiated model or the hybrid model of distance learning. And this is where it becomes a game changer. Because now you're talking about the ability for kids to be in a room and kids to be at home and learn the same thing and have a similar experience. Why is that important to the neurodiverse, you ask? Well, this is where I get really excited in a nerdy way. By doing this, you have now given the neurodiverse kids the opportunity to learn in an environment that is best suited to them. They don't have to sit in class and worry about everything that's going on. They can be at home and still get the same experience. So let me kind of explain that a little further. What, what we've kind of inadvertently created is what's called universal design learning. And it's not that we created it. Universal design already exists. You see it everywhere, right? Um, automatic doors. That's universal design. Closed captioning, universal design. Ramps, universal design. There are things that are designed to help people out that might need a little boost, but also work for regular people too. We do it without even thinking about it. If you go to a bar to watch a game and you can't hear everything that's going on because there's people talking, you can also look up if they've got closed captioning, you can still follow along. Doesn't matter if you don't, you can still hear, it's there. So by having this universal design kind of come into play inadvertently, now we've given students this, this wonderful option of learning. And let me give you an example of how that, that could work. I have sensory processing disorder. As you might notice, I have uh, tinted glasses. Um, when I'm in a crowded area or I'm around a lot of noise, I wear earbuds or earplugs. I, um, I'm very cautious about where I sit. Textiles can be problematic. So all these different issues, the smells, the sights, the lights, can cause me to have a distraction at best. It's, sometimes it's painful even. And I can't pay attention to what's going on no matter what. I may really enjoy this lecture. I can't focus because the guy next to me is chewing gum. But if I'm at home, well, that's different because now I can control the lights. I can put my earphones on if I want to. I can sit in my cozy, wonderful sweats and just learn from there. And I can pay attention and I can focus. That's amazing. Let me give you another example. This one I pulled off of a Reddit discussion board. I'm on a lot of those kind of things, Reddit and Discord and Facebook. And uh, an AD, uh, ADD student was having problems with paying attention during lecture, okay? And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, that's, yeah, ADD, squirrel, right? But it's not like that, okay? It's, it's either a, a, a fo you're completely focused or you're not focused at all. So it's squirrel, huh, squirrels. That's a gray squirrel. That's cool. You never see red squirrels, though. I wonder why you never see red squirrels. Maybe they're indigenous to this area. But wait, there was that movie, that movie with that guy that turned into a llama, and they had a red squirrel too. And that was like in ancient Peru. Is there such a thing as an ancient Peruvian red squirrel? Because that would be like amazing. And why is everybody packing up? Oh, is class over? I think I might have missed something. If the class is being taped, and there are people that are also watching online, now, that person, regardless if they were sitting at home thinking about squirrels or they were in the lecture hall looking out the window, looking at a squirrel, can go back, watch what they missed, and they're not missing out on anything. Bonus points if it's closed caption because now you can know how to spell the stuff too. It's, it's helping things out. It's making a tremendous change. Consider also, 
that there are other students that can benefit from this that may not even be neurodiverse. Immunocompromised children can also benefit from being able to learn in this hybrid environment. I know personally of a teacher who has a kindergarten student that otherwise wouldn't be able to learn in their class, but now they're learning at the same time. They're having interaction with the other kids. They wouldn't be able to do this otherwise. They would be completely homeschooled. No interaction at all. We need to do this. But how? That becomes the issue. The next steps aren't hard, but they are a little time consuming. So what we need to do as instructors is take the principles of universal design learning and apply them to our classes, our hybrid classes, so that no matter if a student is neurodiverse, neurotypical, immunocompromised, has the COVID flu, whatever, they still have the opportunity, opportunity to learn everything that the people in class are learning that are normal. Right, And that means not just having the hybrid class, that also means designing your class so that they can interact in different ways also. Why have just essays? You could have video essays. You could have oral reports. Why just have regular tests? Have a take-home test that, that people can come back to and use. You can have people using audiobooks instead of just regular books, watching movies, and then bringing that back into the classroom and telling about their experience as well. It takes a little extra time, but it is so worth it. Let's also talk about what we can do as allies, as our friends and family, as coworkers of people that might be neurodiverse. We can be good advocates. When we see a situation where someone that is neurodiverse is having a problem, we can speak up. We can amplify their voice. We can help them out. We can legislate, push for legislature that gives people the uh, advantage of the technology that they may not have otherwise. And we can push for this hybrid learning method. So let's take these lessons that we've learned from this time of uncertainty, of the world being upside down, and just turn that tragedy into something tangible, something that can help. Because it's only when we realize the beauty of the diversity of the mind and how many people can learn differently and be different that we can truly amplify the voice of every human being. Thank you.